Am I on? I am on. Let's not stand in front of my own face. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. It's very nice uh, to see all of you here. Um, to be honest, I just got a bit nervous getting on stage because I used to be in Hotel School de Hague, and then I bumped into somebody here, Mr. Sander Allegro. I don't know if he's here, maybe you know him. He used to be my professor in hotel school, so it felt like going back on stage pre presenting my final thesis. But luckily you're here, so that, that really makes everything much nicer. We're going to talk today about the power of branding, um, which is great. Um, as I said, I did hotel school in the past, so I have a very warm heart and I feel a lot of passion for the world of hotels and hospitality. And it's a real honor to be here on stage to combine that passion for the world of hospitality with my day-to-day -day work now, which is all around branding and marketing. As you can see, my name is Ruben Bayer, um, and I am the founder of New and the co-founder of Local Heroes. I must say, though, um, that's how fast time goes in the world of startups. Local Heroes has been terminated last month. Unfortunately, in the, in the current situation, we could not get enough funding to upscale that. But New is still alive and kicking. At NEO, we help brands to move forward uh, by creating marketing strategies and marketing executions, which is a beautiful and expensive word for TV ads, print ads, uh, social content, uh, brand activations, you name it. Um, but today, uh, we're going to talk about the power of branding in specific and branding strategies. Um, see if this works. Last year, I think it was in August, the organization of this particular show asked me to host a creative workshop to look at the way they communicate before, during, and after the event and how they could make that more consistent and more powerful and how they could leave you guys all with a, like, a wow feeling and a content feeling after leaving the show. Um, and after that workshop, we said maybe it's an interesting topic also to host here on the show. Whether it's interesting or not, that's up to you to decide in the next 30 minutes. But here I am on stage, and I'm very happy to talk to you about what branding can do, how it can help you grow and differentiate, but also how it can help you attract uh, talent, how it can boost company pride, and all of that. Before we do that, I thought it would be nice to give you a very brief masterclass about, uh, about branding, what branding is all about, a little bit of history. The word branding originates from the old Scandinavian word brander. Now, I don't know if there's anyone here from Denmark, Sweden, or another Scandinavian, because I don't know if my pronunciation is right, but brander back then didn't really have the same purpose as brands have nowadays. Actually, it was the opposite, because the Scandinavians got so sick of people stealing their, their cattle that they marked them with a hot iron and saying, this is my cattle, it's now brander by me. So it wasn't really like, buy my brander, come here, I have a beautiful brander, you want to see my brander? It was literally like, this is my brander, get, my get your hands off it, I don't want you to come close to it. So brands as we know them today really started to emerge in the late 19th century, uh, during the Second Industrial uh, Revolution. Because the Second Industrial Revolution uh, really introduced mass production. So commodity products, products like trousers, pants, and jumpers, got produced on my skill, but also by multiple factories at the same time. And in order for those factories to make sure that we know that those uh, shoes were actually produced by them, they started to add logos, uh, colors, and other visual identifiers um, to their products. And that's actually how brands originated as we know them today. This is also the time where advertising agencies like mine, like New, started to really become uh, a real thing to put those brands on the map. But brands nowadays are much more than a logo or a, a color or another visual identity. Even though visual identities and logos are very important, they are not the core of a brand. They're more a visual manifestation of the, what the brand is or what the brand positioning is, something we will talk about later. The big question then, of course, is what is a brand? How would you define a brand? And if you would take out your phone now and type in what is a brand, you, you don't have to do that now, I mean, <laughs> I did that already, <laughs> that is fine. Um, uh, you can just sit down, relax, and I did all the research. What is a brand now? You will find many, many different definitions, and most probably there's not one right definition, but combining all of them and looking at my own experience and my own view of it, I think the definition of what a brand is, is this. 
the total experience that accounts for a consumer's decision to choose one product or service over another. I wanted to say as simple as that, but that's not quite a simple statement. The total experience that sums up that originates from memories, stories, perceptions, uh, um, interactions with the brand. It's, it's not really a tangible thing, a brand. It's more a perception, something that we have in our heads. A box that opens up when I see that brand or when I hear about that brand. So, for example, I see LG here. There might be a little box opening up that says quality or that says uh, service or a great design. Those boxes pop open because of all the perceptions that we put in and everything adds up to that brand. A brand is not made by just a color or just a design. And everything is influencing it. Um, the, the people you have, you have working for you add up to your brand image. The, your colors, your design, as I said, but also the way you answer your phone in customer service. Do you answer it with a very warm, welcoming voice, or are you something different? That all adds up to your brand and your brand perception. The, 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 the way people dress, your staff uniforms, all add, add up to your brand image. Look at the difference, especially like uh, 15, 20 years ago, between Apple and Microsoft. If you remember Steve Jobs, he was always very slick and he was always dressed very well and that added up also to the image of Apple. And then you have Bill Gates in his oversized suit with a tie looking a bit quirky, added up to that brand image too. Not one is better than the other, but it's just to, to demonstrate how, branding com how brands emerge and how brands are formed. So what can branding do? Branding do, can do many things for your company. First and foremost, branding is your first impression that you have with potential buyers, potential customers, potential guests, potential consumers, however you want to name them. It is a little bit like going on a first date. If you look at yourself going on a date, it's not just one thing that makes up your personal brand. It's the way you look, the way you dress, the way you talk, what you eat, what you drink, but also your reputation, your friends, and everything around that, that all led us up to your brand. And the same goes for your own brand, your own company. So I always uh, advise marketeers or business owners to look at their brand as if it was a person. What are the personal traits and characteristics that you want to give your brand? How do you want to come across? How do you want to, to people to perceive your brand? Um, because in, in essence, your brand encapsulates your core values of who you want to be. Secondly, branding means recognition. And this is most probably the one of the most important parts of branding. Because, as I said, I just hopped here on stage and it felt for a little bit like I was back in school. Now I want you to think back at your time in school. And I'm pretty sure along the way you had some marketing classes and you remember something like this. The marketing funnel or the sales funnel. From awareness to interest, consideration, intent and ultimately purchase. And this is just one I googled and I put up here. But marketing funnels come in many different shapes and sizes. B big, round, s square, many, many, many different ways. But no matter how many different layers or no matter the shape, there's one thing it always starts with, and that's awareness. People need to be aware of your br brand before they can either, even consider buying it. So branding can help you do that. Branding can help you make stand out and make people aware that you actually exist and what you're all about. And then you go into that whole funnel. So in order to make a sales, in order to sell your product or your services, you first need to wear, work on your awareness and branding can help you get there. Business value is also something that branding influences. If you look at brands like, for example, Nike or Adidas, they are able to charge an extremely high premium for the sneakers they sell you when you compare it to sneakers that are maybe unbranded or from a less well-known brand. And especially if you compare it to the cost that it, uh, that it is to make them, right? They are able to, to charge you to the extremely high premium, largely due to their branding. Because of the perception that we have of those brands, the quality that we, that we connect to it, the status that we connect to it, and all of that. So branding instantly increases your profit margins and your revenues. And you see the same in the, the, the world of hotels. A room at the St. Regis is by default more expensive than a comparable room in another hotel. Yes, they have great service. Yes, they have great rooms. But it's also the, the brand you're buying into. So branding increases your revenue straight away. Aside from that, 
a well-strategized brand and a brand with a good reputation is way more interesting for potential investors than a brand that's all over the show. So also from an investment point of view, branding would increase value. Branding also adds familiarity and trust. If a brand is well strategized and comes across and t tells the same story in all different channels, it comes across much more professional and positive than a brand that's all over the show. If you have a brand that says something on their website and then when you come to their store, they say something completely different and then you buy a product and that experience is different again, you don't really understand what this brand is all about and it doesn't really uh, uh, connect with you. Whereas if a brand is very consistent in everything they do, then you start building a relation with them, you get familiar with them and you're starting to trust them. And then something interesting happens because that's the point where people start talking to their peers about your brand and they actually become one of your most powerful advertising channels because they are going to do your word of mouth advertising. So well, good branding eventually will mean lower acquisition costs too because people will start to acquire new customers for you. Quite an easy one, branding is a driver of loyalty. Because if people buy into your brand because you share the same philosophies or the same values and they experience those philosophies and values once they're interacting with your brand, they're more likely to buy you over and over again and they become loyal customers of yours. And lastly, but not and very importantly, good branding equals happy employees. It's quite hard nowadays to find good employees because especially the younger generation, they're looking for employers that stand for more than just making money. They're looking for a higher purpose embedded in the branding strategy. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to make the world a better place. But at le as long as you have a strong point of view, something that people can connect with and feel uh, comfortable with, then they will start working with you and be much happier and pr even more proud to work for your company. Now the big question of course is, how? I see you all looking at me, Ruben, how can we create our brand that gets recognition, that increases business value, that makes people happy, that makes employee happy and, and get them all running to me. It all starts with deciding how do you want to position your brand in the market space? Who do you want your brand to be? Look at the market space as a big pie. Which piece of the pie do you want to get? Which piece of the pie do you think is close to our beliefs and is commercially interesting enough to actually um, um, make big. If you have, for example, uh, a family business with a stellar reputation, you can use that. You look for the elements in that family business and that stellar reputation that you lift up and that people can connect with. And then you can start to sort of own your own space in the market. Brand positioning, in essence, is finding a space in people's heads, finding that box that need to open as soon as they see your brand name, right? If you are a hotel brand, what box do you want them to open? Is it like, oh, this is that hotel brand that's very cheap? Could be, that could, that could be a positioning. C is the box that open oh, it's very warm surface? Could also be. And this way you can find your, your, your place in the marketplace. And when you do that in the right way, um, there's these three boxes that you need to tick. You have to look at the functional benefits, the emotional benefits and the expressive benefits. And the functional benefits is literally what do I get when I buy your brand? What do I get when I buy your service or your product? And on a functional level, it's very hard to differentiate. Look at the hotel industry. The basic is a bed, good service and maybe a breakfast. And yes, I know there's better beds and softer beds. Yes, there's fluffier towels than the other. But it's very hard to advertise that. There's no hotel that's going to say, we have beds, but they're crap. No one's going to do that. So on a functional level, despite it's very important, it's the core of who you, who you are, it's very hard to differentiate. On an emotional level, ho level, however, that's actually where you can make a difference. What do you want me to feel when I buy into your pro uh, product or service? Am I, is it a happy feeling that you leave me with? Is it a concerned feeling? I hope not. What is the feeling that you want to arouse with me? And then thirdly, the expressive benefit. What do I show when I interact with your brand? What do I show when I walk with that St. Regis bag over the street? What do I show when I stand in my white outfit on the logo of the W Hotel in front of the ocean? 
you show something, is that status, is that, th that's also something you decide with your brand. Once you've decided on your functional benefit, your emotional benefits and your expressive benefits, it becomes very clear how you want to position yourself in the market. And to make this all a little bit more concrete, I have a couple of examples that I like of brands that I really admire because they did a great job in brand positioning and marketing strategy. The first one is Volvo. I think Volvo is one of my favorite brands in the world because they managed to claim a very strong position in the market, largely down to, due to their branding strategy and their brand positioning. Actually, the car industry as such is a great example because they've managed to divide their pie very nicely. Car dealerships are usually all in the same street, usually very close to airports. I don't know <laughs> why that is, but there's one, there's one street with all these different car dealerships, which sounds a bit odd, but they can do that because their marketing strategies and their branding strategies are so well defined. Um, and in that street, Volvo has positioned themselves as follows. To upper class income car buyers, Volvo is a prestige automobile that offers the benefit of safety. In which they've chosen a very, very clear functional benefit, safety. And they've been hammering down the message of safety over the years in their communications, in their activations, in their products. They've even shared all their crash test data with other car manufacturers to show how serious we are about f safety. They've launched side pro products to make people feel more safe and on, the, on the streets. So that the message of safety has been hammering down for years and years and years. But they've also chosen a very clear emotional and expressive benefit, which is prestige. Volvo is not a car that makes you lose your mojo, right? It's still a very sexy car. It's still a car that you would like to step in and out and say, this is my car. And that's, they did a great job in that. That's also why Zlatan Ibrahimovic is in all their advertisements. He's a sexy dad. So it really pays off. It really pays off. Everyone with an income above average who gets a first child, for, for at least a little moment, that box of safety and Volvo will pop open, right? You have your little one in your arms, you think, oh, I need a slightly bigger car, but it needs to be safe for him. Volvo opens up. That's an amazing, amazing uh, performance of how Volvo has done that. And back to that car dealership street, right? Volvo has positioned itself as a prestige safe car. And then there's the cheap cars, and there's the economical cars, and then there's the safe cars, and oh, that's the safe car. There's the, the, the slick car, and there's the sexy car, and the fast car. And because of their branding and their positioning, and because of the perception you have of them in their head, before you even enter that street, you've already made a pre-selection of what car, de car dealerships you will enter and which you wouldn't even bother about. And that's where brand positioning gets very scary. Because some people may not feel that connection with you anymore because you've chosen a certain direction. Some, you're not for anyone anymore, but that's all right. Because the people that are going for you have a much stronger connection with you and are more likely to come back over and over and over again. And in your hotels, you don't even have enough beds to, beds to host everyone. So you better want people to stay with you, have a full warm connection with you, start talking to you, and are willing to pay this extremely high premium for you because they have that connection with you. And of course, the car industry is not the only industry where it works. The beer industry, and especially the lager industry, is a very good example too. Also because on a functional level, on a product level, there's very little differences. Now I know there's a lot of people out there, especially men, who think they can taste the difference between a Budweiser and a Heineken and an Amstel and a Carlsberg. Especially in your industry. <laughs> uh, but, but trust me, 99% of the people cannot. So to, to differentiate yourself on a product level is very hard in the world of beer and lager. So you need to find your space in the market, through, in other ways, through, through a very strong brand positioning. Now, Budweiser, Heineken and Corona, according to Interbrand, are the three most powerful beer brands in the world. And how have they managed to become so powerful? By very distinctive and very ownable brand positionings. Heineken play on the inside that no man, they're targeting men, no man wants to feel like a provincial amateur. No man want to be that guy that can't participate in any conversations about art, sports, music, or fashion. No man wants to be that guy I don't really know where I have to go to. No, you want to be a man of the world. 
a man who knows where he's going to, a confident man. And Heineken enables and inspires you to actually be that man of the world. That's why they sponsor the, the most ultimate man of the world, James Bond. And that's why they're involved in like the most premium sporting events like the UEFA Champions League and Formula One. And if you, sh if you drink a Heineken, you show the expressive benefit that you know your way around. If you walk down the club with a Heineken, you show that you are a man of the world. Budweiser, Budweiser celebrates the extraordinary things that ordinary people can do. By hard work, never give up, put your everything into it, you can become a king. In essence, what they do, what they did, they positioned their, their, their brand as the American dream in a can. Now, I'm not a big fan of the American dream, that whole notion. I think, ah, no offense, it's just, it doesn't do anything to me. And therefore, I'm not a big fan of Budweiser. But that's all right, because there's millions and millions and millions of people who love the notion of the American dream and who love Budweiser as a beer for that reason. Then Corona, they believe that you can get in the beach state of mind anywhere, every time. And they do everything to give you that, that lovely sunset, re relaxed feeling. And it's a beautiful day now outside, but it's cold. And if we would go to the bar after this, which would be a great idea, and order a Corona, we all get that little smile on our face and a little bit of a feeling we're at the beach. So they also managed to establish themselves in the market, and that's why you go for Corona. Now, to close off, I want to give you one example in your own industry, in the world of hospitality and hotels. Um, because I think, like the car industry and like the lager industry, uh, the hotel industry can benefit greatly from great brand strategies and, and great brand positioning. Because, as I said, the product in itself, I know it's different, but it's very hard on a functional level to make a difference in your communications and your advertisements. So you need to do it in a different way. You need to find out how do I stand out? How do I get people to know me, talk about me, and ultimately buy this extremely high premium of me? And that starts with positioning, finding your position in the market, embrace that, and really live up to it in every aspect of your business. And this example that I want to give you is not just an example, it's a personal story um, of where I saw well, maybe things could have done a little bit better. Because last year, me and my family, there we are, we went to Valencia in Spain. Now, I don't know if there's anyone from Valencia in Spain. No, then I can be honest. No, <laughs> that's, um, it was a great trip. Valencia is a great city. This was last January, right off the back of Corona. You see some masks here and there still. The sun was out. It was our first uh, uh, family trip as a family of five. All happy days so far. Um, and we stayed in this hotel the only U hotel in Valencia. Now it gets really, is there anyone who is remotely connected to the only U hotel in, no, okay. If so, then just see this as a very, it's free piece of advice that I would normally charge an extremely high premium for. Uh, the only U hotel, right in the city center of Valencia, I think it's a small chain, four or five hotels in, in, in Spain, and I can really, really honestly recommend this to anyone. It's a great hotel, extremely nice service, super comfortable beds, beds, and a breakfast to die for. But there was this one thing that kept triggering me, and that was this, only you hotels. Only you hotels. It's intriguing, right, that name? Because to me, as somebody who's crazy about brands and branding, it's some sort of a promise. It's really something that I was like, oh, so we booked, and then I Googled uh, what's on their website, and this is what they said. Um, this brand aims to place its guests at the very core of the experience to offer a memorable and personal stay suited to each traveler's style. The secret, a young man. I was like, wow, they're really sort of building this up. This is, they're, they're lying down the red carpet for themselves because there's some sort of a promise that's a huge opportunity from a branding standpoint. So me and my wife, who happens to be also in my advertising and also looks at brands the same way as I, we were like constantly, okay, when is it coming? When are they going to do something only for me or only for her or only for us? But it didn't happen. It was, again, it was a great experience, but it was very generic. So from a branding point of view and from a brand positioning point of view, I think there was a missed opportunity. Um, and I want to underline one more time that we had an uh, amazing stay, and I would recommend this hotel to everyone. But they could have made it even better, 
more extraordinary, more special, more so that I would talk, talk about it, not only on a stage to talk about branding, but to my peers, to my friends, and to my family. If I would have been in charge, I would have done everything to ladder up to the promise that a impli name implies. For example, and this is not a great idea because I just came up with it last, uh, yesterday when I was finalizing these slides. Um, what if, upon check-in, they would have asked me four or five additional questions right, about the thing I like, where I'm from, and all of that. And then they would have pretended to enter that in the only used supersonic computer. Ooh, well, Ruben, look, I printed out for you a special walking tour only for you. I see that you have three small children, so it's no longer than 30 minutes. You just told me that you love sports and you love a drink. At the end of the walking tour, there's a little sports bar. They have this local beer, which you should really try. We printed this out only for you. I would have been, wow, they really live up to it. It's not a personal, it's just one of the five tours they have. They just printed my name on top of it. But it's just doing these little things that add up to a brand and branding and consistency and builds up to something I would really understand and, and trust and talk about. They could have printed out a chat GPT AI generated welcoming letter on my bed, especially for me. They could have done all these little things to make this only you promise that the name implies really work. Or they would have changed, could have changed the name. Maybe that would have been much easier. <laughs> so then the big question, of course, does this really work? Does a well-strategized brand really increase business value, get you recognition, uh, uh, get pe people happy, get people come back and back to you? The short answer to that is yes. There are many, many studies about the effectiveness of brands that are actually investing in their branding and advertising uh, um, efforts. And I don't know if you know the marketing professors Les Binet and Peter Field. They wrote the book, The Long and Short of It, which you can, I can highly recommend. They did a study and they looked at brands that kept investing during the last recession in, in 2008, investing in their branding and in their advertisement. And those brands recovered much quicker and gained huge market shares once the economy, economy started to build up again. Um, so yes, it really, it really works. And I think we can all also see it in our own lives. Some of the examples I just gave before, I think we recognize that in, in what we do. I think, look at you, all of you, you look amazing, you're dressed very well, I feel very underdressed, and I'm pretty sure that some of you have paid an extremely high premium for the suit you're wearing or the pants you're wearing, and that's fine. Because that's the perception we have of those brands. They're qualitative, they're comfortable, they, they, they show that I, that I know what you should wear. And that's what branding does. And that's what we should all embrace because that's also something that we can do. So I would advise all of you, when you go back to your day-to-days, to look at your own brands, the, the companies you work for, and look at the soul of your brand and try to land on a brand position that's true to who you are, that's differentiating, and that's something that you can really build on. And usually that doesn't mean look all the way to something else, but look at what you believe in, what your employees believe in, and embrace that. Try to write that down, and then try to leverage that and bring it to life in anything you do, from the check-in procedure, to your website, to your rooms, to the products that you have in the bathroom. Everything adds up to building your brand. And once you do that, I'm pretty sure that not only on the short term, but also on the long term, you're building a company, you're building a business that, are peop that people will talk about and are willing to pay an extremely high premium for. Thank you very much. <coughs> and now I think people can ask questions, right? Any questions? It was so clear. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Oh, there's a question. There's a microphone coming your way. Yeah, I think maybe sometimes people have to let it sink also. But um, my question would be, so um, I guess social media is important nowadays um, for you also to not just do advertisement on printed media, but also social media. And then I was wondering me, for instance, as a startup, um, I'm alone. Shall I focus all my energy in this social media where I know the conversion rate is zero? Because my product will not, I, I'm in perfume, so you cannot smell it. You cannot, yeah, you can convey the message, but the conversion rate still will be zero. Shall I still 
invest my time in social media? Yes, the short answer is yes. I would first invest your time in brand positioning. What do you br want your brand to be? What kind of perfume brand do you want to be? I mean, perfume is almost a fashion brand, right? If you look at perfume ads on TV, you see the strangest thing. People diving off cliffs and then, oh, Davidov. It's like, what, what has that to do with a cliff? It's just an image. It's a world that you're creating. And I think in your mind, and you can't create a world like that, but on paper and in your mind and in your business, you're trying to pin down what is the world that we are creating? What are the functional benefits? You smell nice. But what is the feeling that you want to give? You feel lovely, you feel happy. You feel Try to find that too. And then you can s slowly starting to build an audience around that too. Because who are the people who want to feel happy and are maybe feminine? And so you, then you create your audience and you can target quite specifically on, on social media. And maybe it doesn't convert directly but it does build your image and it does build that familiarity and it does build the trust. And once they come to a point where they can buy you, the box opens up. So, oh yeah, of course I want a perfume. So yes, I don't think you should always only look at advertising channels or communication channels that convert directly because that's not always, and that's hard because you have to invest your money into something that you don't get back immediately, but that's investment on the long term. So any investment rounds you do, also find investors that believe in the power of marketing on the long term. Because I know there's a lot, and as I said, local heroes uh, went to sh because uh, we couldn't find more investments because they only wanted us to invest in the short term and optimization and cost, uh, cutting costs. Whereas I believe if you really want to push a new market, a new brand into the market space, marketing and awareness and recognition is extremely important. Don't, don't um, optimize the bottom of the funnel if you don't fill it up with more people because otherwise you, you're trying to optimize maybe 10 people, just bring more people into that funnel first. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, what would be the, the minimum uh, percentage of your, uh, let's say if you're a five-star hotel uh, in the city center of uh, Amsterdam yeah. uh, and you want to um, improve your review uh, scores or your re reputation, what would be the minimum spent uh, on branding? Uh, so, to be very honest, I don't know the exact answer for the hotel industry and the hospitality industry. There is a golden unwritten rule that investing around 10% of your revenues into marketing will actually have an effect. So if you look at Coca-Cola, for example, I think they're investing 12 or 13% every year of their global revenue into marketing, which is incredible, incredible amounts if you know what their revenues are. So I would always look around 10%, especially when you're an established brand. If you're a new brand, you might, may even want to invest more because your revenues are still very low. Um, but it needs to be a significant amount. I always say either go for it or don't go for it. I've seen too many brands trying to do a little bit of marketing, which is not effective, but you, can't, you, you don't create enough eyeballs on what you're creating, you don't, and then it's not effective at all. So then you better spend nothing. Just, just leave it and try to do it in another way. But if you want to go into the market space and really do something with your branding and your advertising, invest in it and, and believe in it. And don't judge uh, um, whether it works or not work after a month. Let it run for six months or a year and then really see a difference. Any other questions? Yes, one more here. Thank you. Uh, you had this example, it was uh, only you hotel, which failed to be true to their branding mission. However, maybe you have some nice examples where the hotel and hospitality were true to themselves or to their branding and really like amazed you. Ooh, there's, there's many actually. Um, and I, they didn't fail me. Let, sorry, again, it was a, it's a very good hotel. And if you go to Valencia, stay there because it's a great location and a great hotel. But, and I also don't know what their branding strategy is. I don't, but the name implies that it is something and the, the, the little thing on their website implies that it is all for us. I like, I can really enjoy luxurious hotels. Um, because they live up, they have the budgets usually to live up to, the, to all these little things. As I said, uh, the St. Regis is, is a great hotel because you constantly feel like a king or a queen when you're there. And that starts from the experience on the website to if you look at their social media, uh, then when you book, you get a very nice letter or a very nice email that makes you feel special. So it all adds up. And again, they have budgets, so it's not a very fair comparison. But to me, any brand, 
in the hospitality area industry or on other industries, as long as you stay true to what you promise or what you want to be across everything you do, I love you because I, do, uh, because I understand. And I understand what you stand for, uh, um, and then you can build a connection with it. And yeah, I know what to expect. So if I buy that very high premium, well, that's it, what it's all about, right? You, you're branding and you're advertising because you want people to buy from you. I only buy, I only pay a very high premium into something that I think or know that will ride, will be good and will be worth it. And you build that, and you build that trust by being consistent in anything you do. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your days.